Praise the Lord. I welcome you to the Bible study today. And I pray that this study will be a refreshing time for every one of us in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for our Bible study tonight. Thank you for your people. And thank you because you always teach us bringing things that we need to know out of your word. We're asking tonight you'll teach us by your spirit. And everyone will profit by your word in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Once again, I welcome you to the Bible study tonight. And I pray that this will be a refreshing time, a learning time, a profitable time for everyone. As you know, we are studying from the gospel according to St. Mark. And tonight we come to the next chapter, that is chapter 15. We've studied all through from chapter 1 to chapter 14. And now we're looking at Mark chapter 15, verses 1 to 15. But I'll just start with reading the first two verses. Please open your Bible. In Mark chapter 15, we're looking at verse 1. And straightway in the morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. Then he tells us in verse 2, in verse 2, and Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. You'll find the two uh, people mentioned in verses 1 and 2. Number 1, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of the Jews. And then number 2, Pilate, the governor in that part of Israel of the nation at that time. Who was the Lord Jesus Christ? And what was the accusation they brought against him? They brought the accusation that was the king of the Jews. The king of the Jews. And that's what the word of God has affirmed and confirmed. That Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews. And then the second person, Pilate, he was the governor in the land at that time. And the council, the members of the Sanhedrin, the leaders of Israel, after they had said openly themselves that they had no right, no authority to put anyone to death. But because the governor had the final authority, so they brought the governor unto him. They had decided this is what should be done. They had decided he was guilty. They had decided he'll be put to death but they wanted the affirmation, the confirmation, the authority of Pilate, the governor, to get that done for them. Now, as to the fact that Jesus Christ is the king of the Jews, that was plain to them. They knew it. If you look at Psalm 2, and I'm reading here from verse 6. Psalm 2, reading from verse 6, you'll find what the Lord himself had affirmed. Psalm 2, reading from verse 6. It says, Yet I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. And then in verse 7, it tells us, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. If you will link those two things together, I have set my king upon my holy hill, Zion, and thou art my son. The Lord of heaven, God of heaven himself confirmed, this son, the son of God, is also the king that the father had set. Actually, if you look at Micah chapter 5, looking at verse 2. In Micah chapter 5, reading from verse 2, you will find what the scripture had said. But thou Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, 
yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, to be king in Israel, to be the king of Israel, to be the king of the Jews, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So it wasn't uh, something that just came up at that time, uh, from everlasting. This Jesus, the Son of God, had been from everlasting. And it says he will be the ruler of Israel, the ruler in Israel, the king of the Jews. Now, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees and the council and the elders and the priests, they were not ignorant of that. You know, in Matthew chapter 2, reading from verse 2, when the Lord Jesus Christ was born. Here is what we have, Matthew chapter 2, we're looking at verse 2. It says, saying, where is he that is born king of the Jews? The wise men that came from the east, the wise men that came to Jerusalem, they wanted to know the king of the Jews has been born. And we want to know where he was born. But we have seen a star in the east and a calm to worship him we are come to worship him now in verse 3 in answer to that question when Herod the king had heard these things he was troubled and all Jerusalem was seeing what did he do look at verse 4 in verse 4 it says and when he had gathered all the chief priests and the scribes of the people together look at this he demanded of them where Christ should be born. Are you following what we're reading? He called him Christ, where Christ should be born. And then the people said, we're asking, we're looking for the king of the Jews. And they said, where is he that was born? Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, and they said unto him, they said unto Herod, the priests, the chief priests, and those elders and the leaders in Israel, they said unto him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophets. In verse 6, they quoted from Micah, they said, And thou Bethlehem in the land of Judah art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor, capital G, a king, uh, that's capital K, a leader, capital L, a ruler, capital R, a governor that shall rule my people, Israel. And so they knew about Christ, they knew about the Son of God, and that Son of God will be the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Now, let's look at Pilate. Who was Pilate? And let's come to Matthew chapter 27, and we're looking at verse 2. Matthew chapter 27, we're reading from verse 2. It says, and when they had bound him, bound the Lord Jesus Christ, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. That's the title of a Pilate. That's the authority of Pilate. He was the governor of the people. But I want you to look at Luke chapter 13 and see the personality of this man and see the lifestyle of this man and see the kind of authority he manifested. We're looking at Luke chapter 13 and we're reading from verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him, they told Christ, of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And that's how terrible it was. There were people that were sacrificing and they were worshipping their God and Pilate said, go catch those people, arrest them and kill them right there and mingle their blood with the blood of the sacrifice they were offering in Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. Reading from verse 27. Acts chapter 4. Reading from verse 27. For the truth. Against thy holy child Jesus. Whom thou hast anointed. Both Herod and Pilate. Pontius Pilate. With the Gentiles. And the people of Israel. Were gathered together. They were gathered together. Look at verse 28. 
It says in verse 28, For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determine before to be done. Well, everything the did was not beyond what God had ordained. All things under the control of God. Actually, from all eternity, uh, the Father had decided that Christ will come, his only begotten Son will come, the King of the Jews will come, the King of kings and the Lord of lords will come, and he will make sacrifice for our sin, for our evil. That's why when John um, the Baptist saw the Lord Jesus Christ, he said the next day, John said Jesus coming, and he pointed at him, Behold, the Son of God, the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. Well, we have uh, been introduced now to uh, those two personalities that we're going to read more of in this passage we're looking at today. The message tonight is Christ, the heavenly prince before an earthly pilot. Christ, the heavenly prince before an earthly pilot. We're dividing the message to three parts. Number one, the eminence of our righteous prince. The eminence and the power and the authority and the exaltation and the life of Christ, the presentation of Christ higher above all those elders, all those priests, and even Pilate or Herod himself, his eminence, the eminence of our righteous priests. Number two, the envy of the religious priests. The envy of the religious priests. Actually, Pilate himself knew that for envy they delivered Jesus to him. It wasn't because of what he said about being the son of God, about being the king of the Jews. It was because they envied him. He had gone around, he had gone about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And they themselves said, Caiaphas said, if we let this man alone, he will take the whole nation. All the nation will follow after him. And because of that envy, that's why they plotted, that's why they planned, that's why they arrested. And that is why they took him to try him and to kill him, to get rid of him. The envy of the religious priests. Number three, the evil of reproachful Pilate, Pilate himself. He knew the truth. He knew that Jesus Christ was innocent. And he said over and over and over again, I find no fault in him. Yet he scorched him. Yet he allowed crown of thorns to be put on his head. And yet he crucified him. He himself he had reproach. He himself was unrighteous. The evil of reproachful Pilate. Let's come to number one. Number one is the eminence of our righteous prince. He's our prince. Let's look at uh, Mark now, chapter 15. And we're reading from verse 1. Mark uh, chapter 15, uh, reading from verse 1. And straightway in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. In verse 2 it says, And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest. And then in verse 3 it says, And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. I want you to underline that in your Bible. That's very important for Christ, important for you, important for me, but he answered nothing. And then in verse 4, it says in verse 4, And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against me. In verse 5, it affirms again, but Jesus yet answered nothing. So the Pilate marveled. He was meeting somebody for the first time that they will lay accusation against, that they will slander, that they will bring false witnesses against, and yet that person will not defend himself. And because of that, 
Pilate marvel. Let's look at three things here. Number one is the scorn against Christ. The scorn against Christ. Number two is the silence of Christ. And number three is the standard for Christians. The standard for Christians. Number one now, we're looking at the scorn against Christ. We have read that already in uh, Mark chapter 15, uh, verses 1 and 2. I want you to look at verse 32 now. In verse 32 of Mark chapter 15, it says there, Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross. They had crucified him now, but the jesting continued. They have crucified him now, but the piercing slander continued. They have crucified him now, but the scorn and the reproach continued. That's why they said, let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross, that we may see and believe. And they that crucified with him reviled him. They that were crucified with him reviled him. The reviling, the slander, the lies, the piercing scorn, everything coming from all directions. The scorn against Christ. Was that a surprise to people that knew the scriptures? No. God knew that will happen. And the Lord Jesus Christ himself knew that will happen. He tells us in some two reading from verse 1. In Psalm 2, we're looking at verse 1. It says, why do the hidden rage and the people imagine a vain thing? In verse 2, it says, the kings of the earth search themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. The two counsel together, and the council met, and the elders met, and this is what had been prophesied in the word of God. In verse 3, it says this, what they were saying, let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Look at Psalm 22, verse 7. Psalm 22, we're looking at verse 7. It says, all they that see me, love me to scorn. That's prophecy. That's prophecy about the Messiah, about the king of the Jews, about the ruler of the people, about our Lord, about the righteous one, about the pure one, about the spotless one, Jesus Christ the prince, Jesus Christ the king, and Jesus Christ the ruler, righteous through and through, righteous without any sin. And yet, the prophecy had come, all day that see me, love me to scorn, they shoot out the leaf, they shake the head, and then it says in verse, uh, in verse 8, saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him, let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Exactly what he was saying to the Lord Jesus Christ, there was scorn. But let's come now to uh, Mark chapter 15. Mark chapter 15, let me remind you again of verse 3. In Mark chapter 15, verse 3, and he's talking here now about the attitude of Christ, about the silence of Christ. It says that the chief priest accused him of many things, of many things, of many things. And he did dog up, you know, this and that. All those things were lies. All those things were false witnesses against the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at this. But he answered nothing. Look at verse 5. In verse 5 it says, But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now, why did Jesus keep quiet? And what's the significance of his quietness, of his silence? And there are seven things we're pointing out. Number one, the silence of a conqueror. The silence of a conqueror. You see, he conquered already. He had conquered them. He conquered sin. He conquered temptation. He conquered Satan. He conquered evil spirits. He conquered all those false witnesses. He conquered everyone and everything. He's a conqueror. He had been a conqueror from all eternity. And at that time, at the time of the trial, he was still a conqueror. And so, 
a conqueror will not have to fight a battle he has won already the silence of a conqueror in isaiah chapter 53 verse 7 isaiah chapter 53 verse 7 and he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth that's prophecy Isaiah had predicted about 700 years before Christ even came to this world as Christ the Son of God incarnate. It says he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb so he openeth not his mouth. He knew he had conquered. He knew that this was prophesied concerning him. And because of that, as he conquered, he was silent. Number two is the silence of conviction. The silence of conviction. Uh, you, you know Christ. Christ can bring them to conviction by his silence. Actually, we see an example of that in John chapter 8, verse 9. In John chapter 8, verse 9, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one being convicted by their own conscience they had brought a woman to the lord jesus christ they said we took this man in the very act of adultery and moses said stone her what do you say and he said nothing and then they kept on saying, what do you say? Only one sentence, see, that has no sin among you. Let him cast the first stone. And then they kept quiet, the silence of conviction. And it says they were convicted by their own conscience. They went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. Number three is the silence of courage the silence of courage you know cowards talk a lot those who are fearful they talk a lot and those who are panicking they begin to say and they defend themselves they say that's not so and this is so and all that they talk a lot but you know when you are courageous and when you are cool and when you know that already you are an overcomer a conqueror and you don't have to talk so much look at hebrews chapter 12 and we're looking at verse 3. hebrews chapter 12 verse 3 for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself he endured all the contradiction of sinners against himself and he endured silently he endured quietly it says lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds uh, he wasn't defending himself he had the silence of a conqueror the silence of conviction and the silence of courage now number four is a silence of consecration the silence of consecration he, he said you remember in his ministry he that sent me is with me and he has told me what to do and what he has taught me and what he has outlined for me that i do he was consecrated to the will of the father he said i came down from heaven not to do my will but to do the will of him that sent me what's the will of him that sent him he sent him to sacrifice for our sins he sent him to shed his blood for our sins and because he knew that he was consecrated to that that's why he said in john chapter 18 reading from verse 11 john 18 verse 11 then said jesus unto peter put up thy sword into the sheep the cup here is consecration the cup here is commitment the cup here is absolute surrender to the will of god that's why i was silent he knew that he must drink the cup he said the cup which my father has given me shall i not drink it it was consecrated to the will of the father he said i'm willing to drink that cup i'm ready to drink that cup and because of that why would he defend himself? Would he be trying to get out of that situation, not to drink the cup? The silence of consecration. Number five is the silence of commitment. 
the silence of commitment in uh, first peter chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 23 first peter chapter 2 reading from verse 23 when he was reviled he reviled not again he didn't throw the stone back you know, there are some people, and when you throw a stone at them, I don't mean you, you cannot throw a stone at anybody. I mean, when somebody throws a stone at them, they pick up that stone and they target that fellow and they throw the stone back. When they are reviled, they revile again. And when you talk about them, you assault them. Me, you talk about like that, and the insult again. But you know, Jesus Christ, he tells us who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. It's the silence of commitment. He committed himself to him that judges righteously. Number six is the silence of contemplation. The silence of contemplation. When you contemplate, you are meditating, you are thinking, you are ruminating, you are turning these things over in your mind. And Jesus Christ was there, he was thinking of the scriptures, the scriptures being fulfilled. He was thinking of prophecy, the prophecies being fulfilled. He was thinking of the Father contemplating and planning and thinking. Here is what God was, and he was contemplating, he was thinking and meditating on the period of this, uh, of this uh, pressure and this persecution. He knew that he will soon die, and he knew that he will soon accomplish the salvation of humanity. He knew that he will soon say, age is finished. He knew that this will not prolong, will not go on forever and ever. Those words are still going to come. It is finished. And he was contemplating. He was thinking of that in Mark chapter 14, reading from verse 16. Mark chapter 14, verse 16. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, saying, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witness against thee? The first part of verse 61, it says, But he held his peace and answered nothing. The silence of contemplation, the silence of concern. He was concerned for them. He was looking at them. He was uh, thinking of the judgment that will come upon them. Uh, and because of that, you see, when he carried the cross, that you'll find in Luke chapter 23, from verse 28 to verse 31, uh, he, when he carried that cross and the people were weeping for him, uh, but Jesus turning unto them said, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. He knew what will come upon them and because of that concern he was meditating he was thinking if these people only knew the judgment that will come upon them that's why they didn't have to answer anything and he said don't wait for me wait for yourself and for your children and so we understand the reason why christ kept quiet and the reason why he had the silence number two then the silence of christ is a silence of a conqueror is a silence of conviction is a silence of courage is a silence of consecration is a silence of commitment is a silence of contemplation is the silence of concern. Why are we learning all this? Number one, it's written in the scriptures, and all things that are written aforetime are written for our learning, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Why are we learning all this? Because it is scripture, and all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's good for reproof, it's good for doctrine, and it's good for instruction and for righteousness, and that the people of God may be perfectly furnished unto all good works. Why are we learning all this? 
because the time might come to you when you are falsely accused the time might come to you when you are at a crossroad and some of these things that happen to christ might happen to you for you to understand here is the example of the lord jesus christ that he laid down for you and for me that led me so to the third section here the standard for christians the standard for christians we're looking at first peter chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 21. First Peter chapter 2, we're reading from verse 21. It says, For even hereunto were ye called, here is your calling, even hereunto were ye called, ye believer, you are born again. Here are you called. When you are born again, persecution might come, and difficulties might come, and people might say things against you you never expected they would say against you because now your life is better you're a new creature in christ all things are passed away all things have become new even when you were an unbeliever they didn't say so much negative things against you like this one now that you are born again here is the standard for the child of god who is born again and more so when we are sanctified here is the standard for the sanctified believer and after you are saved you are sanctified and you are filled and baptized immersed in the holy ghost and the holy ghost and the holy spirit takes over your life here is the standard for us the life of christ the silence of christ for even here unto were ye called because christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that ye should follow his steps christ has left us an example and we're to follow the steps and the example that christ has laid down and now he explains in verse 22 what we're to follow who did no sin neither was girl found in his mouth no lying no deception you know there are people i want to get out of trouble therefore they lie there's guile in their mouth i don't want them to know that i committed sin i'm going to settle it privately with the lord and now they are asking me i'm not going to tell them and they are not even going to keep quiet they will bring a bigger lie to cover a smaller lie but jesus christ who did no sin neither was guile found in his mouth out. look at verse 23 in verse 23 who when he was reviled reviled not again that's an example that's the standard for you and for me when he was reviled he reviled not again when he suffered he threatened not that's an example that's a pattern for you and for me you might uh, suffer uh, unjustly but it says you will not threaten when he suffered he threatened not but committed himself to him that judges righteously he committed himself to him that judges righteously let's look at some 39 i'm reading from verses one and two Psalm 39, we're reading from verse 1. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. My brother, my sister, the easiest way, the ready way to sin is with the tongue. As you look at the children of Israel coming out of Egypt and going to the land of promise, the land of Canaan, their greatest sin was the sin of the tongue. Either they are murmuring, either they are complaining, either they are talking against Moses, or they are asking questions, why this and why that. The sin of their tongue, they did not learn the spiritual lesson of being quiet or being silent. They didn't have the silence of the conqueror. They didn't have the silence of conviction. They didn't have the silence of courage. They were not courageous just enough to know that i must be quiet there are times we don't need to talk they need to have the silence of consecration they need to have the silence of commitment they need to have the silence of contemplation 
always talking and talking. They were not thinking. They were not meditating. And he had the silence of concern. But David said in uh, Psalm 39 verse 1, I will take heed to my ways that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. And let me borrow an illustration from the, uh, from the face mask uh, where you see nowadays, you know, as we're going out and people are before you, you cover your mouth, you cover your nose. And uh, what if we were to do that every time, even after COVID-19 is over and that uh, physical one that we're using now as a mask is taken away, but you imagine Imagine that that thing is there, it covers your mouth. You think before you speak, do I need to talk about this or do I need to keep quiet at this time? I will keep my quietness, I will keep my silence so that I sin not with my tongue. I'll keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. Look at verse 2. It says in verse 2, I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good, even from good. There are some good, good things I could say about myself. I, all these people that are accusing me of this and that, I could say, but I healed uh, your nephew, I healed your cousin, I healed your mother, and I cast out devils from, you know, that member of your family. There were good things Jesus Christ will bring up. He even raised the dead. He could have spoken about all those things, but David said, I was dumb or silent. I held my peace even from good and my sorrow was turned. It tells us in verse 9, it says in verse 9, I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because thou didst eat. The Lord Jesus Christ knew that this is coming from the Father. This is the agreement between him and the Father. Because of that, he knew that this is the will of the Father. Because thou didst say it, I will not open my mouth. Look at Luke chapter 2 verse 19. In Luke chapter 2 verse 19, we're reading about uh, Mary the Virgin, Mary the mother of Jesus, but Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You remember uh, the, the quietness and the silence of Mary when it was, she was pregnant of the Holy Ghost and Joseph, uh, you know, would have, uh, wanted to even put her away. No argument, no defense, no self-defense, and there is uh, no shouting and screaming, and there was no fighting. Mary kept all those things in her heart, and eventually the Holy Ghost had to convince Joseph that this is of the Holy Ghost. And eventually when the child was born and people came and they said, what will happen to this son of yours when he comes of age and he had to sacrifice for the sin of the people? Mary didn't, uh, you know, ask questions and talk and talk and talk. Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And let's look at First Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, we're looking in at verse 19. Here is what our attitude ought to be. Here is what our disposition ought to be. That thing that is uh, sometimes in us, like a lion wanting to come out and pounce on the people, wanting to come out and tear the people apart, let that lion die. And let the thing that is on the inside, always wanting to talk, always wanting to defend yourself, always wanting to, you know, thrash it out, argue it out, let it die. After we are saved, there is Christ that lives on the inside. We're sanctified. He lives bigger on the inside. And we're filled with the Holy Ghost. He comforts us. He gives us peace. He gives us purity. He gives us power. He gives us control. We ought to be able to control whatever it is arising from the earth. It says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 19, Wherefore? Let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls unto him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. And that's what we have learned there, the standard, what Christ has laid down. 
the pattern of his quietness and the pattern of his not opening his mouth to say anything for personal defense let that be an example for you a pattern for you and a standard for you and for me as well we're coming to point number two now as we look at mark chapter 15 reading from verse 6 mark chapter 15 we're looking at it from verse 6 this is the envy of religious priests it says in verse 6 now at the feast he released unto them one prisoner whomsoever they desired in verse 7 and there was a one named barabbas which lay bound with them that had made insurrection with him who had committed murder in the insurrection then in verse 8 it says and the multitude crying aloud began to desire him Pilate to do as he had ever done unto them then in verse 9 what were they asking for but Pilate answered them saying were ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews do you want me to release unto you the king of the Jews and then he tells us in verse 10 for he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy he knew and everybody knew he knew Pilate knew that they had delivered Jesus because of envy and number one the perception of envy by Pilate the perception of envy by Pilate that's what it says in that verse 10 it says for he Pilate knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy in Matthew chapter 27 reading from verse 18 Matthew chapter 27 reading from verse 18 for he knew that for envy they had delivered him Mark said it and Matthew is saying it then it says in verse 19 in verse 19 it says when he was set down on the judgment seat his wife uh, sent unto him saying have nothing to do with that just man for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him that's a just man that's a righteous man my husband Pilate don't have anything to do with condemning him to death you understand as I understand that he is being delivered unto you because of envy the perception of envy by Pilate and look at Proverbs chapter 27 verse 4 envy is heavy envy is terrible it says wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous but who is able to stand before envy who is able to stand before envy you know there are times when people have envy and because of that envy it tell a lie against an innocent person there are people that have envy and because of that envy and they bear false witness against a righteous saved child of god what kind of envy and what brings such a envy you know sometimes it's even surprising between husband and wife and between husband and wife the wife is doing a trade and the husband is doing a trade and it appears the trade of the wife is successful more successful than that of the man and the man now because of envy begins to say uh, my wife is a witch and will call the children and uh, don't trust your mother don't uh, go along with your mother your mother is the one that is taking all my good things and all my star and all my success and she has evil diabolical power and she's uh, bringing everything to his side all because of envy and will create enmity and division in the family sometimes it's like in a company you're working in a company and you just got there you go from this level to the next level and from that level to the next level and the other people are wondering where did he come what certificate does he have 
what experience does he have? Was he doing that we are not doing? And actually, they are not pulling their weight and they are not doing the right thing. And because of envy, they will conspire together and they will tell some lies against the man, against the woman that is making progress. Envy is terrible. Who can stand before envy? Sometimes it's even in an extended family. Uh, you know, the child of that woman and the child of this other woman, this one has gone to university and this one is making progress. And the other people, because of envy, they are not born again. If they were born again, they will not have the mind of the Pharisees. They will not have the mind of the chief priests. The cruelty of envy will not be in them. The anger of envy will not be in them. Surprisingly, uh, they begin to look for maybe juju medicine, how to bring that person down. He will be sick at the time of exam. This one will happen, that one will happen. And it is all because of envy. And that envy is going to be judged by the Lord. Wrath is cruel. Anger is outrageous. But who is able to stand before envy? And let's come to the second section now. The preference of envy in the priest. If you look at Mark chapter 15, reading from verse 6, there was a principle in the land of Israel that when they were having their feast, the king or the emperor or the governor will release one of the people to them just to celebrate with them and give them, grant them amnesty and give them release. And they wanted the same thing. And Pilate thought, this is my chance. This man, Jesus, innocent and righteous and pure and spotless, I'm going to use this to release him. That one should be released to you during this praise, during this feast. But look at the preference of envy of the priest. Look at Mark chapter 15, verse 6. Now, at that feast, he released unto them one prisoner whomsoever they desired. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, and there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them that had made insurrection. He had caused trouble in the land. And even in that insurrection, somebody had been killed, and they found him guilty of murder. That's why they put him in prison. But now, look at the preference of those priests, he said, who had committed murder in the insurrection. Then in verse 8, in verse 8 it says, and the multitude crying aloud began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. What that means is, release somebody to us. And so he wanted to know, who do I release unto you? Look at verse, uh, verse 9. It says, but Pilate answered them, saying, Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Verse 10. He was asking that question because he knew, for he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. What was their preference? What did they say? Look at verse 11. In verse 11, but the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them and crucify the Lord Jesus Christ, the preference of envy in the priest. And you see, sometimes, and let's say, for example, somebody is before you, and you know the fellow, the fellow is sharp, the fellow is intelligent, and the fellow is, is quick, and the fellow has experience, and you have the chance to give him the job. But you can guess that this man, if he comes in, he will outshine you. If he comes in, I'm not talking about you, I'm using that you, uh, in, they call it, uh, you know, a kind of a pronoun. I'm, I'm using that you for generality. And you know that this fellow will outshine you when he comes to the place of work. And you say, ah, ah, I will not allow this to happen. And then you take somebody dull, somebody not quick, somebody not experienced to say, that's the one we recommend. Why do you recommend that one? Because of envy. Because, you know, if this one comes in, it will outshine me. That's exactly what the chief priests did. They wanted to get rid of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
They didn't worry about his innocence. They didn't care about his righteousness. They didn't care about his perfection and blamelessness. That did not interest them at all. They said, we'll rather have a Barabbas, a murderer, that will come back to the nation and give him liberty and give him freedom. If he wants to kill more people, release him and let him do whatever because of envy. My brother, my sister, we need to check up our hearts. Are there some little, little things, decisions we take about people? Are there some little, little things, ideas we project about people? Are there some things, maybe in our families, maybe in the church, maybe in that section and in that section that we do, not because we are serious about righteousness, about holiness, and about justice, but because of envy? What do you prefer? Who do you prefer? And why do you prefer that? Why do you prefer that person? Is it because of envy? Uh, let's, let's look at Isaiah chapter 5, and we're looking at verse 23. Isaiah chapter 5, we're looking at verse 23, which justified the wicked for a watch. He justified Barabbas, we justified the wicked for a word, and taketh away the righteousness of the righteous from him. And taketh away the righteousness of the righteous from him. And we have to be very careful, we have to be very cautious, and we have to be very much committed to the standard of holiness and righteousness so that our preferences, our choices are not made out of any private idea, any envious disposition, any jealousy in our heart, and we're not taking the righteousness of the righteous away from them, and we're not justifying the wicked Barabbas in any way. And let's come to section three now, the punishment of envy in any person. The punishment for envy in uh, any person. In Mark chapter 15, uh, reading from verse 10, uh, for he knew that the chief priest had delivered him uh, for envy. Now, we who are leaders need to have perception. Perception. You are in a particular committee, you are among some groups of people, and you have to take decisions. You take decisions about individuals, you take decisions about young people, you take decisions about, you know, somebody is, uh, trying, is uh, wanting to get married, and somebody is uh, trying to get this privilege or that privilege. We take decisions. We take decisions about appointing people to do this and to do that. We need to have perception. And what others are saying about this man before you, what they are saying about this woman before you, we need to have perception about what they are saying and who is saying what and why they are saying what they are saying so that we don't make our choice on the basis of envy. We don't make our decisions on the basis of envy. And we don't say there's a final scene, I've decided that's what will be done. And then there's at the back of the mind, there is envy and there is a wrong attitude. The judgment will come, the punishment for envy in any person. It says, because Pilate knew that the chief priests had delivered him for envy. And then we're told in Isaiah chapter 26, Isaiah chapter 26, and I'm reading here from verse 10. Let favor be showed to the wicked, yet will he not learn righteousness. You show favor to Barabbas, he's killed, he has mothered, and he, he, he staged up insurrection, and he's a difficult fellow, and he's a, an injurious man in society, and you release him because of envy, let favor be showed to a wicked man, yet he will not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, will he deal unjustly, and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, Heaven, Lord, when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see. 
when thy hand is lifted up, they will not see. Pilate did not see. The chief priest did not see, even though the hand of the Lord and this Christ before them with all his silence and quietness, yet they will not see, but they shall see and shall be ashamed for their envy. They shall be ashamed for their envy. When the judgment comes upon them, they shall be ashamed of their envy at the people. Yea, the fire of thine enemies shall devour them. The fire of thine enemies shall devour them. There is judgment, there is punishment, there is damnation because of envy. In Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 29, Romans chapter 1, we're looking at verse 29. It says, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. You understand? Envy is unrighteousness. Envy is a sin. I put it directly. Envy is what will bring people to judgment, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers. It tells us the conclusion in verse 32. In verse 32, who knowing the judgment of God upon all those sins, knowing the judgment of God on those wrong attitudes, knowing the judgment of God against envy, who knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death envy if you're full of envy if i am full of envy if anyone is full of envy you cannot keep on saying i am saved uh -uh. envy does not reside in the heart of someone who is saved i am sanctified don't say that if you're full of envy envy does not reside in the heart of the one that is pure and holy and sanctified you cannot say i'm filled with the holy ghost the Holy Ghost does not dwell, does not abide in the same heart where there is envy. What will come is punishment and judgment. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them, that do them, have pleasure in them, that do them. We come to point number three now. In point number three is the evil of reproachful pilot. We come to Mark chapter 15. In Mark chapter 15, we're reading from verse 12. Because now the final decision is going to be taken. You see all those people were their envy. They couldn't take the final decision without Pilate. And Pilate knew that this Christ was the son of God. He was the king of the Jews. Not only that, he was innocent. He was pure. He was righteous. But let's see what Pilate did. We're told in Mark chapter 15 verse 12. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? Look at verse 13. In verse 13, And they cried out again, Crucify him. We're not thinking it over. We're not reviewing what we have said. We planned he should be crucified. That's why we brought him evidence or no evidence false witnesses or no false witnesses whether it's the son of god or not whatever will happen even if the heavens will fall and fall upon us this is the one thing we demand of you crucify him look at verse 14 in verse 14 it says then pilate said unto them why what evil has he done and they cried out the more exceedingly crucify him they didn't answer the question when he said what evil has he done what evil has he done? What sin has he committed? What action of his son? Mary's being crucified. They didn't answer that one. They just cried out the more exceedingly crucify him. And look at Pilate. Look at verse 15. It says in verse 15, so Pilate and so Pilate, look at the next uh, part, willing to content the people willing to satisfy the people, willing to please the people. He wasn't looking at the law to judge 
the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't looking at the evidence to judge the Lord Jesus Christ. He wasn't looking at the fact that the wife even said, my husband, this is an innocent, just person. He wasn't looking at that. He wasn't looking at what he himself found out, that I find no fault in this man. All he was looking for now, willing to contain the people, please the people. He released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he has caused him to be crucified. What do you learn of uh, this man here? Number one, let us see the confession of mindless Pilate. The confession of mindless Pilate. And let's look at Matthew chapter 27. We're reading from verse 24. Matthew chapter 27. And we're reading from verse 24. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. He called him a just person, a righteous person, a blameless person, a guiltless person, a faultless person. And yet he surrendered him to be crucified. A mindless judge. We're looking at uh, John chapter 18, uh, verse 38. John chapter 18, uh, we're reading from verse 38. Pilate says unto him, uh, What is truth? And when uh, he had said this, he went out again uh, unto the Jews and says unto them, uh, I find in him. Uh, no fault at all. I tried him. I questioned him. I investigated. I used all the methods I learned as a judge to probe him and to know what fault I can bring against him. And I want to tell you, I find in him no fault at all. Look at chapter 19 of John. John chapter 19, we're looking at verse 4. Pilate therefore went forth again and says unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. This is what I know, and this is what I want you to know, that I find no fault in him. Look at verse 5. In verse 5, then came Jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate says unto them, Behold the man, innocent man. Behold the man, just man. Behold the man, righteous man. Behold the man, the perfect man. Behold the man. In verse 6, it says in verse 6, When the chief priest therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate says unto them, Take ye him and crucify him. For I find no fault in him. How is it he was going to release Christ to them to be crucified when he found no fault in him? He was mindless. He didn't have his mind. He didn't act according to the right mind. Can that be leveled against you? That the decisions you take, you take not because you do that out of your own mind, but you are mindless. You are not thinking of the truth you know, the actions of your life, the direction in which you go, the utterance of your mouth. There's contradiction. I find no fault in him, and yet crucify him. Your action to the closest person to you, your action to the people who are loving, the people who are good, the people who are just, the people who are righteous, your actions to them. Are you not contradicting yourself? Have your mind, not the minds of the people. Have the mind of Christ. 
that you know everything you do. You are not doing like a mindless pilot. Let's look at number two. This one is even surprising. The conciliation of mischievous personalities. Look at chapter 15 of Mark. Mark chapter 15, reading from verse 15. It says, and so Pilate, willing to contend the people, was that he wanted to smoothen the relationship between him and the people, and he wanted to use Jesus Christ as a sacrifice for that. This will please the people. This will conciliate the people. This will calm the people down. And if that's what I have to do, if I have to be unjust, if I have to be unrighteous, if I have to misplace judgment and release Barabbas and then crucify the innocent one so as to appease the people and so as to content the people, that's what Pilate will do. The conciliation of mischievous personalities. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scorched him to be crucified. Look at Luke chapter 23, reading from verse 6. Luke chapter 23, looking at verse 6, when Pilate heard of Galilee, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. Verse 7, in verse 7, and as soon as he knew that he belonged unto Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was at Jerusalem at that time. In verse 8, in verse 8, And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceedingly glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to have seen some miracle done by him. Verse 9, then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered him nothing. He was looking for a miracle. He questioned him with many words, but Christ answered him nothing. He was a judge that could give a recommendation to Pilate, and therefore he questioned him many things about what he had heard about Christ, about his power, supernatural power, divine power, heavenly power. He questioned him in many words, but Christ answered him nothing. And look at verse 12. In verse 12, this is important, the same day, Pilate and Herod were made friends together the same day Pilate used Jesus, the trial of Jesus, the suffering of Jesus, Pilate used Jesus, the misplaced judgment on Jesus to make friends with Herod. For before this time, they were at enmity between themselves. What do you think about that? This is a weak personality, Pilate. Is a wicked personality, Pilate, and this is a sinful, despicable personality, Pilate. He looked at the case of Jesus, and he knew that Jesus was innocent. But just to make friends with um, Herod, he sent Jesus to him, and he said, I'm pleasing you with Jesus. And then can we condemn him together? What you say is what I say, and what I say is what you say. And he made friends together with Herod because before that time they were at enmity between themselves, the conciliation of mischievous personalities. And then let's come to John chapter 12, verse 43. John chapter 12, verse 43. It tells us about these people that Jesus commented about, for they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. 
Think about Pilate. He loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Think about Herod. He loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Think about those religious priests that took Jesus and they wanted Barabbas instead of Jesus because they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Think about religious people today, religious priests today, religious pastors, preachers today. They love, many people love the praise of men more than the praise of God. They will do anything and they will condemn anyone and they will take whatever decision. Whatever decision they believe that will make the pastor be happy, will make uh, those uh, great personalities happy. They're not looking at the word of God. They're not looking at the word of righteousness. Whatever will make them happy and make them my friends like Pilate and Herod, that's what they will do because they love the praise of men more than the praise of God. It tells us in Acts chapter 24, Acts chapter 24, we're reading from verse 24. This man was even the one that called Paul the Apostle and he wanted to hear the word of God and the word of the kingdom, the word concerning faith in Christ. It says in Acts chapter 24, verse 24, and after certain days when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul, look at this, and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Verse 25, when Paul the apostle preached the word unto him, and as a reason of righteousness and temperance and judgment and the judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time. When I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Go your way at this time. Your word is convicting. Go your way at this time. You talk of righteousness. I'm not ready for that yet. Go thy way for this time. You talk of temperance, self-control, and you talk about uh, the, 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 the control that will come upon a person when he becomes a child of God. Go thy way this time. Not ready yet. And you talk about the judgment to come that will come upon the people that live in sin and die sinning. Go thy way. But this time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. Look at verse 26. Look at this look at this for he hoped also that money should have been given him or Paul bribery corruption didn't start today has been on since that time that Paul will bribe his way through like some so-called apostles do today so-called pastors do today and so-called preachers do today that they'll give money and give bribe and call it another name, not call it bribe, so that they can get out of the situation in which they are out of persecution, out of unfavorable consideration by the powers that be, or so that they will get land or they will get some property for their ministry, for their church or for their assembly. This man hoped also that money should have been given him or Paul, that he might lose him. Wherefore, he sent for him the offner. Often and often he will send for him no more to hear the word of God. Money, bring money. I have the power. I will release you. And he commutes with him. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, but... After two years, Pontius Festus came into Felix's room. And Felix, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, willing to show the Jews a pleasure, again, wanting to content the Jews, wanting to please the Jews, and wanting to go along with the Jews, willing to do the Jews a pleasure, let Paul bound all such people are condemned by God, condemned by the word of God, and condemned by the whole of society. The condemnation of miserable men pleasers. 
the condemnation of miserable men places in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1, I were reading from verse 10. Galatians chapter 1, we're reading from verse 10. Here, Paul the Apostle said, For do I now persuade men or God? Do I now um, conciliate men or God? Do I now content men or God? Do I now fear men or God? Or do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? Do I seek to please men? Hold on. In your activities, personally now, I'm talking to you. In your decisions in life, I'm talking to you. In all the things you do, by yourself and the things you do with people and the things you do concerning people and the judgment you take and decisions you make concerning people and the message of the word you preach and the counseling you give whatever it is in your action do you see to please men or to please god are you like Pilate? are you like herod are you like felix are you like those Jews that will want to please themselves or please men? Are you like Saul? Saul of the Old Testament, I feared the people in order to please them. That's why I did what I did. I knew the word of God. I knew the standard. But do you seek to please men or do you please God? Paul the Apostle said, he said it for himself, he said it for me, he said it for you. For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If you still please men, you want Christ crucified. And Pilate said, I find him innocent. I find no fault in him, but I'll please you. And to please you, I scourge him, I release him to you. He wasn't a child of God. If you do the same thing, you know, instead of pleasing God, instead of obeying the word of God, you hurt people, you oppress people, you persecute people, you deny people of their rights so that you can please either yourself or please men and you are not pleasing God, you'll not be a child of God. You'll not say you are born again. You'll not say you are sanctified. The Lord wants us to recollect and to regather ourselves and to look at all this story we're reading and apply everything to our lives and now to know that whatever we do, whatever we say, wherever we go, whatever decisions we make, whatever we preach, whatever we counsel, and whatever decisions we make, we're out to please God in all things, at all times, with anyone, concerning anyone, and concerning ourselves. For do I now pursue it, men or God? Or do I seek to please men? If I yet please men, I will not be a child of God. If I yet please men, I will not be a candidate for heaven. If I yet please men, I will not be a servant of Christ. If I yet please men, I will not be a faithful steward of the kingdom and of the treasure of the Lord. If I yet please men, I will not be a person that is confident that I'm ready for the rapture and for the coming of the Lord. The Lord wants us to examine our lives and to look at all these stories and to see where we fit in and whether we're on the side of the Lord Jesus Christ, having the same mind with Christ, the same nature with Christ, the same heart and the same mind and the same disposition with Christ, or the same mind with Pilate. Let's stand up now and call upon the name of the Lord. Let's seek the face of the Lord today and let the Lord apply the word to our heart. Please stand up and think about the words we've heard. We've heard about Christ, the heavenly prince, before an earthly pilot. And we want to be more like Christ, more like Christ in our disposition, more like Christ in our very heart, more like Christ. When we come to him, we turn away from sin. We turn away from the world. We turn away from darkness. We turn away from injustice. 
we turn away from unrighteousness and we turn to Christ, the righteous one. We turn to Christ, the heavenly priest, who can make us righteous. We turn to Christ, who can forgive us. We turn to Christ, who can cleanse us. We turn to Christ, who can probe, who can search, who can examine, and then who can cleanse us in the blood of the Lamb. If we come to him appropriately, if we come to him properly, if we come to him with the right heart, if we come to him with true repentance, he'll forgive us, he will cleanse us, and then he will set us free. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And will be free from every sin, free from envy, free from jealousy. And he'll take the nature of Pilate, the character of Pilate, the mindlessness of Pilate away from us. And he'll give us the very mind of Christ. Disconch him. But you wouldn't react when you are scorned, when you are slandered, when they bear false witness against you, when they put a painful, scourging, scandal against your life. Be like Christ, and he was quiet. The quality of Christ. We all need that. I personally need that. If I need it, you need it to silence, quietness. Not always talking and talking and talking. I like to defend myself. I preach holiness. I preach sanctification. I want everybody to know I'm righteous and holy and sanctified. If there's any problem, I want people to know I'm free. I'm a preacher. I'm holy. I don't have any evil sin behind my mind. I want everybody to know I'm a preacher that goes along with what I preach. But the Lord doesn't want me to always affirm, confirm, defend myself. The same thing with you. He wants you to have the silence of a conqueror. Conquer that mind that always wants to argue always wants to defend yourself, always wants to project yourself, always wants to blow your trumpet, I am innocent. Have the silence of a conqueror. Tell the Lord to help you. Let grace come in and he'll give you the silence of conviction. If you have conviction, you don't have to shout all the time, defend yourself all the time. You have conviction that God is on your side, that's enough. You have conviction that Christ is on your side, that's enough. You have conviction that the grace of God abides in you and you are in the path of righteousness, that's enough. That conviction that gives you peace of mind, that's enough. Have the silence of conviction and the silence of courage. Don't have the noise of a coward. Our people tell us empty barrels make the loudest noise. Be quiet, be courageous, and carry yourself with dignity. You don't have to talk, going about all the time. Instead of witnessing, instead of talking about Christ, you're talking about yourself all the time. That's enough. The silence of courage and the silence of consecration Persecution comes. If you are consecrated to the Lord and you say, Lord, I will endure anything for you, then don't cry. Then don't shout. Then don't fight. Then don't beat the other person down. If you are consecrated and you say, I'll go any length, I'll climb any mountain, I will endure anything you know, for the sake of Christ, uh huh, then Make that consecration work and be silent and be quiet. And the silence of commitment, you commit your life 
you commit everything you have into the hands of the Father as to a faithful creator. Because of that, that commitment will make you quiet. And the silence of contemplation, a thoughtful person, a meditating person, the silence of contemplation and the silence of concern. You are concerned for your soul. You are concerned for the souls of other people. You are concerned for eternity. You are concerned for making it at the rapture. That concern, let it make you quiet and silent. The silence of concern. Envy, never. Whatever others have, no envy rejoice because of what they have no competition canal competition there's no competition sinful competition there's no competition jealous envious competition let people enjoy what they have and you whatever you have whatever privilege you have I'm not even worthy of this. I don't merit this. And God has granted me chance to enjoy this out of his mercy and love. That's enough for me. And God has even promised more. Let the other fellow enjoy what he has. Let the other fellow continue in the goodness of God. No envy. No envy. Don't surrender anyone to crucifixion. For persecution, for death, for evil, because of envy, there's punishment awaiting those whose hearts and minds are full of envy. The Lord is telling us not to go the way of evil, reproachful pilot, knowing the truth and not able to walk by that truth. Not able to affirm that truth. It says the man has no fault, and yet they brought him to be scourged. And yet he crucified him. And yet a crown of thorns was put upon his head. Why? What cause for that? Why do we make other people suffer when we know that they're innocent? Don't have the confession, and then the contempt and the conciliation of Pilate. Condemnation will come at last for the people who allow that heart mindlessness of Pilate to be on them and those who allow the mischief of Pilate and Herod to be on them and those who use human beings, people to please others yet make innocent people suffer. Don't allow the devil to use you and then for you to please man. Because if you still please men, you will not be a child of God, candidate of heaven, a ready bride for the rapture and for the coming of the bridegroom. And you will not be a servant of Christ, a steward of Christ, a person who is faithful in the position the Lord has given you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Father, we thank you for what we have learned today. You have answered our prayer. You have revealed your mind, your truth, and the application of the word to everyone faithfully. We are asking, O oh Lord, that this word will become an indelible part of our heart, indelible part of our soul, indelible part reaching upon the table of our heart. Lord, we pray it will be unforgettable when it comes to the practical areas of life 
and we have to take decisions. It comes to the practical areas of life, and we have to walk a particular way. We have to relate with people around us in the family, outside the family, in the church, in the office, in the market, anywhere. We pray that this word we have heard will become so much part of us where we live like you want us to live with the mind of Christ, with the justice of Christ, with the righteousness of Christ, and with the holiness of heart we ought to have every time in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, anyone that is found guilty, anyone that is found unrighteous, we pray as they repent and turn away from sin and turn away from unrighteousness and turn away from darkness and turn away from the evil habit and the evil disposition of envy. Oh, Lord, we pray you forgive and you cleanse in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you set us free, so free that no evil we are itself into our lives anymore in Jesus' name. Because upright, because righteous, because just, because bold, because courageous to live by the conviction you have given us anytime, every time in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, you keep on cleansing your people, you keep on perfecting your people, and you make us ready for the coming of the Lord, for the rapture in particular, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. Confirm your word of salvation and confirm the grace of sanctification and the power of the Holy Ghost in every life. We thank you because we know it is done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.